We're so glad you're here. Next time, Pastor, let's pray for people with OCD. I had some announcements here, and somebody cleaned it off of the uh, pulpit there. Uh, if you would, on your way in, uh, you have a, um, oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> you have a bulletin. We have a bulletin. It's got everything that's going on here at Community. We want this place to be your family. We want this place to be your home. And so if you're wanting to get plugged in or involved, we've got plenty of opportunities. You're going to find them right inside of here. Also, if uh, this is your first time or you consider yourself new, we have a red card right in here. And uh, we want to know that you came and visited us today. So if you could fill that out, and if you would, drop it in the offering. Or better yet, bring it to the Red Room after service, and you can meet Pastor uh, uh, Daniel and Mary Beth, and they'd love to say hello. In addition to that, on the back, we want to pray with you. We want to partner in life with you. And so we have a spot back there to fill out your prayer request so we can be uh, right beside you and all that's going on. A couple of announcements. You heard the shoe boxes. Don't forget to pick those up on your way out. Another big one this week is uh, Thanksgiving, which is exciting. We get to go spend time with our family. We will not be here Wednesday night. So if you show up, you probably won't be able to get in. And if you do get in, please let us know because we need to secure the facility better. So um, uh, we will not be here. So I just wanted to give you that heads up. And then one more thing. How many of y'all noticed it's a little uh, dusty and we're working out there? We're really excited about what God is doing, the opportunities he's given us. Uh, we're doing some extra work, so forgive our mess. Hopefully that will be all back in place by the time you make it back next Sunday. But in addition to that, we need some extra help. If you would, uh, Mr. Wagner will be at the, um, the banquet table. Of course, buy your tickets for the banquet coming up in a month. But if you have the ability today at 2, we've got some things. We've got a punch list. We've got to take care of some things before the, uh, the contractors come in and uh, make some things happen. We could use your help. If you've got a young back or if you've got a, a wise mouth, if you would come in and help us out, uh, we would love some extra help at 2 p.m. So just get with Mr. Wagner. Uh, it's a third table back. He'll be selling banquet tickets, but we'd love your extra help today. We appreciate it. Thank you. I'm trying to decide if I want to have a young back or a wise mouth. <laughs> That's today at 2, uh, which is unusual for us to do something on Sunday, but we have to get that punch list done. Uh, the other thing is uh, you get to today, those of you that signed up for Thanksgiving baskets, get to deliver those today. Mary Beth will be passing out the gift cards that go in those immediately after service. If you're going to uh, deliver a basket to a family in need, will you stand up so we can pray over you as you go out and do that this week? Give them a hand as they stand. We're so thankful. You know, Community Church for years has done gift baskets, and we've done baskets uh, upwards of 75, 100 to give to families in need. And, and for a long time, we had them come pick them up. But a couple of years ago, we began to deliver them and to pray over those boxes individually and connect with those family members. And so you're going, not just bringing food, you're bringing the bread of life with you. You're not just bringing a gift from community church, you're bringing a box of the kingdom with you. And so we're going to pray over you as you begin to carry out and you become the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. You know, the Bible says that Jesus did nothing miraculous uh, w when it came to people. Almost every time it came to people, a miraculous touch with people, it said he was moved with compassion. And you were moved with compassion, with the heart of Christ. So church, will you reach out your hands towards these that are standing up? Now, you know what? That's not fair because many of you gave to make that possible. If you gave uh, for these people to deliver, will you also stand up? If you gave to make that possible. Thank you very much. So we believe in pray, give, and go, right? We're going to pray, some gave, and some are going. Father, we declare over these guys that as they deliver, that they will not only be safe, that they'll walk into pleasant environments, that they will walk into people that are grateful, uh, that are ready. But Father, whatever they walk into, 
I pray that they will go in the spirit of the King of kings and Lord of lords. I declare over them peace, that they will be carriers of peace, that they will deliver not just a box of groceries, but they will deliver a container of the kingdom of God as it sets in their homes. It will be like the ark of the covenant setting in their homes and bringing blessings because your people delivered them, your people prayed over them, your people gave them. So, Father, I thank you. I thank you for each person that gave and that's going, that's making this possible. I pray that these families will be blessed. And they won't see community church. They'll see heaven. They won't see a denomination. They'll see the goodness of God. And Lord, we may never see on this side of eternity uh, anything come of that. And that's okay. What we want to see is spiritual fruit forever in their lives. That there will be a little kid that will eat Thanksgiving Day knowing... knowing that your kingdom made that possible. Father, that there'll be a single mom that receives some groceries that she couldn't provide for her kids. And she'll know the kingdom of God provided that meal. Father, may these boxes go with the compassion that moved your heart, that caused you to touch those in need. We too go moved with compassion to touch the needs of those you've placed within our sphere of influence. Use it, redeem it, and make it, make it kingdom in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. You know, guys, we come to a point in the service where we begin to talk about tithe and offering. And I know for some people that makes you very nervous. (laughs) Uh, Visitors get very nervous sometimes when we talk tithe and offering. That's okay. What we want to talk about is investment and kingdom. See, we believe that we're called to invest in the kingdom of God. And in fact, in all the promises of God throughout the uh, Old Testament, even into the New Testament, there's only one time in God's word He said, put me to the test. He said, in the area of tithe and offerings. He said, you've robbed me. Do you know what? Sometimes we rob God. We don't rob him from things he needs. We rob him from the things he wants to give us. God, the Bible says he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The Bible's trying to give us a word picture. To tell us our God is all sufficient. He doesn't need our stuff. What he wants is for you to build a a venue, to build a highway of blessings. He says, some of you are, you're robbing me of my ability to bless you because your road's always under construction. (laughs) It's always under construction. How many of you like it when I-10's under construction? Guys, I'm 42 years old. There's been a part between here and Beaumont under construction since I was born. But one day, it's going to be 17 lanes of pure highway speed. You know what? My lane has always been under construction. Father, I'm going to try to learn how to tithe today. and I got some workers up telling God, slow down. Slow down. There's times he prompts me to give, and I say, well, if I give, I won't have what I need. Have you ever been tempted to, tempted? Have you ever been prompted to give to someone else? And you thought, well, if I give to them, then I won't have. They need to get a job. I thought that stuff. And I realized the highway of God's blessings in my life, it's got its road construction signs on it, telling God, slow down. Slow down. What if the only thing hindering his blessings in my life isn't his heart? It's my construction. And so what I'm telling you is when I come to give, this is an exercise for me to stretch. To take down some construction signs and to say, God, you're free to flow in my life. The other day I had a young person. Well, they're a little, I say young. They're about my age. I want to be young so bad. 
And he said, he said, my wife and I, we just started tithing. He said, it's a miracle. My electric bill went down $100 this month. Now, here's the, here's the not so great miracle. It's between seasons. My electric bill went down too, right? I didn't, you know. But what he saw was a correlation between I trusted God and something good happened. And here's the truth of it, God. That is the reality. That something good's going to happen. It may be the right season. He says, oh, here, that's right. It may be your tires last longer on your car. Or for some reason you get a little bit better gas mileage than that sticker says you ought to. Or maybe some of your clothes won't wear out. Because some of you people have been given since the 70s. I can tell your clothes had not wore out yet. The kingdom of God. And so we're going to have an opportunity to take a construction sign down. And I just enjoy giving to God. In Psalm 41, it talks about the blessings of those who give to the poor. To those who are in need. And one of the great things that I don't think the church always understands is what happens with your money. When you trust it to God and you give back. Obviously a portion goes to paying light bills. But out of every time you write a check. See we ask you to tithe because that's what the word of God says. Well community church tithes as well. And so not only do we pay our bills just like you pay your bills. But we take a portion of that out. 10%. And 9% goes to missions. And 1% goes to benevolence. And I want you to know that Joe Will and... And some of our board members that fun, uh, serve on the Benevolence Committee and on the Missions Committee. Matter of fact, if those committee members for Benevolence or Missions, if you'll stand up. Let them see who you are. Stand up. Give them a hand. <clears throat> These guys take that 10%. And they begin to pray and send it out. And it covers missions and missionaries. And it covers your neighbors when they call up and say, I can't pay my electric bill. That's what your giving does. Because we want to stand before God and we want to unlock the roadblocks. And we want to say, community church, we love all people, rich and poor. And we'll take care of those who you trust us with. So today we give an offering to God. And he says, your offering takes away the roadblocks of blessings from me to you. And it shows our love for those that we're trusted with. Ushers, will you stand to your feet as we prepare for the offering? Give them a hand. <clears throat> Father, as we begin to give these offerings to you today, I ask that you will bless the giver. Your word says... That we give with a cheerful heart, not, a, not begrudgingly, not of necessity, but with an with a attitude of happiness, with gratitude, with excitement. Father, we give with excitement because I can't wait to see who you bless with this. I can't wait to see what you build, what you call us to. We give with excitement this morning. Father, so we ask that you'll bless those who give. And that you'll remove the roadblocks that have kept your blessings from flowing in our lives. But Father, we also pray for those who will receive because these people give. Because we are faithful to you, how you unlock heaven's goodness over some in our community that are needy. Over some in our body that are needy. And how we're able to send to around the world to touch India and Mexico and Honduras. And how we, we even touch into, into Russia. And we, we touch the corners of the world into China. Father, I thank you. I thank you that we get to be a part of a global initiative to see your kingdom come to earth. Father, bless the hands that give. Bless those hands that receive it. And may we be a blessing to you as we disperse this offering into our community and beyond. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give.
We've been talking about uh, the family, and we're going to continue to doing that. You can turn to John chapter 10 as we uh, continue in this process. Last week, uh, I hope that you had a chance to spend time with your family a little bit uh, because we, uh, Risa passes out, uh, and Joshua and Dan pass out on Wednesday night a piece of paper for your kids to bring home. And for those of you who do not have kids or grandkids at home, you can get on the uh, Facebook or the website and print off those same things. And it's just really to promote uh, a Thursday night family night, to have a chance to get together and talk. And this last week we talked about what it meant to have a vision uh, for your family. And, you know, I talked about during the sermon having a vision because God said He has a vision for us. And in Revelations it tells us in chapter 5 that He has a picture of us becoming kings 
and priests that will rule and reign with him. And so my vision as a dad uh, in my home is to help my kids step into their kingdom of, of kings and priests and in my case, I have two queens as well uh, that become leaders to rule and reign with God forever. Well, this week we're going to build on that and realize that there's some uh, place we have to go. So even though this is a uh, uh, week of Thanksgiving, we will not have a Wednesday night service. You can get on the website and get that information so you can continue your Thursday night discussions. Uh, we've had tremendous discussions at our family, uh, so it really helped us as well. But I want you to think about in John Chapter 10. Hopefully you've had time to, to get there by now. Uh, in John 10.10 10 is a very familiar verse we have where the Bible says the thief uh, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, but I've come that you may have life and life more abundant. Well, after that, Jesus begins to talk about who he is. He's kind of led up to it. And in this point, he begins to talk about I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd... One who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling who does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by my sheep. Jesus has given us this picture of a shepherd and what his heart is to those he's responsible for. That he's not a hireling, he's in all the way. And his heart is to protect them and keep them. And he draws a distinction between who he is and who a hireling would be. Someone that would leave and, and run. Well, this morning we're going to talk about fighting for the family. Can you imagine being a shepherd needing to fight for your sheep? Can you imagine that? I, I can just imagine a shepherd. In fact, David, before David faced Goliath, he faced a bear and a lion. See, every battle, when we fight, is preparation for the next victory. It's preparation for the next victory because we were called to be victorious. We were called to be more than conquerors. And you know what? This world is such, situated in such a way, tilted in such a way that we're in a battlefield. We're in a war zone. And so we're going, to be, we're going to be battling. And we're going to have to fight for our families. Who is fighting for your family? Think about that. Who's fighting for the minds, the hearts, the souls of your children, of your grandkids? Who are fighting for the hearts and minds of those who serve under you in ministry? As a care group leader in your care group or a discipleship group leader in your discipleship and, or journey group. A life group. Who's fighting for that? It, it, maybe you're an employer. You're a boss. You're a supervisor. Who's fighting for the soul and the mind of those that you have been placed in a position to oversee? Now here's the difference between me and you and everyone else. But when we, cause when we become followers of Christ, when we give our lives to Him, first and foremost... We are His. We were bought with a price, the Bible says. We are not our own. No matter where we find ourselves, you go there as an ambassador of Christ. You go there as a shepherd. You shepherd small groups. You shepherd young hearts. You shepherd workers. You shepherd responsibility. But there's a problem. Somebody has to want to fight for their flock. Somebody has to be willing to fight for their family. Because there is always a fight for your family. I want you to think about how things... And I don't want to go back to the good old years in 1890 when everything was simpler. Dude, I like electricity. I like air conditioning. I even like a little television now and then. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to go back to any time before they had the History Channel. Okay? I wouldn't have anything to do. But at some point, something's happening in our culture that we're moving faster and farther away from the values that define who we are. And suddenly we're letting other things define us. Other things are capturing our hearts. Other things are capturing our imaginations. Other things than, than the kingdom of God, than mom and dad. And somewhere we've got to... Step back a little bit 
But we've got to be willing to be willing to enter into the fight again. We've got to be willing to take up the shepherd's staff and begin to look and say, where is it that we need to, need to fight? You are called to be a shepherd in your home. How many of you live in a home? Raise your hand. How many of you are in a position of leadership in that home? Raise your hand. Some of the men are going, can I raise my hand? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. You know what? Probably the best word that we would find in the Bible to describe that is the term overseer. Turn with me to Acts chapter 20. In Acts chapter 20, uh, Luke is the author of Acts. The Holy Spirit has prompted him to write. In chapter 20, verse 28 and 29, he says this, Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church, the family, the people you're responsible to of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. I want you to think about this. The Holy Spirit is saying through Luke, you overseers, you people in positions of responsibility, moms and dads, I don't care if you're a stepmom or a stepdad, if you're a grandparent raising grandkids, whatever level you find yourself in, people are in your home. Today we have what's called the sandwich generation. We have mom and dad that are taking care of mom and dad and taking care of their kids' kids. A lot of our people in our church are in that sandwich generation. Guess what? You've been called to be an overseer, to guard the flock. We have, we have places that uh, before Christ or somewhere the enemy got into marriages and broke them apart, and now we have single moms. Mom, guess what? You are an overseer of your flock. We have single dads. You're an overseer of your flock. We've got blended families. Community church is the strangest church in America sometimes because we have blended families where the spouses just trade at each other and we go, wait, you used to be with, their, that's your kids, but they're, so we got blended families within the family. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I guess that's good. We forgive people. So we've got moms, that, we got stepdads and stepmoms and stepmoms and stepdads and kids that belong over there and come over here. But guess what? You're overseers. You don't get to say, well, I'm just a step. I'm just a backup. No. See, government didn't give you that with a marriage license. Society didn't give you that. Uh, what gave you that was God when he said, this shall be a family again. And now you're going to shepherd the flock. God's called us. No matter where we find ourselves, when we are in a place of influence to be a shepherd. School teachers. We have school teachers here today. You are called to be a shepherd, an overseer of the flock. Are you guarding their hearts and minds and souls? Group leaders. Do you want the right to speak into someone's life? Then be willing to shepherd their heart. That's how we oversee. It's not always easy and it's very seldom convenient. How many of you have figured this out? How many grandparents know this? Parenting is hard work. How many of you like being a grandparent more than you like being a parent? <laughs> my gra- my mother in law says it with a big smile on her face. Her faith. Her it's her faith too. Her face. She'll give my kids something my kids aren't supposed to have, like candy right before supper, dessert before you eat, that kind of stuff. You know, the parent me's going. And she says stuff like this. I was the parent for X amount of years. Now I get to be the grandparent. I'm going to go. Yeah, that's funny. (laughs) See, I'm still in that parenting stage. Where I'm still trying to be the overseer. And I don't need that pressure. Grand gives me cake. Grand needs to go home. Grand needs to go home. So I say, honor, honor. Okay, I'm going to get off that one. 
I can talk about Papa. <laughs> Guys, here's the deal. It's hard. And it gets harder. And now sometimes our grandparents are stuck with their, with their, with their trying to be the grandparent and the parent again. It's tough right now. And then you get bland, uh, blended and you don't talk about the vision for your family. And Bob says, where there's no vision, the people perish. Why? Because they cast off restraint. And if moms and dads blended families, hear me well. If a blended family, mom and dad, do not have great communication skills, the kids will rule the roost on you. You've got to talk. And you can't just talk like, how was your day? You've got to be intentional about your conversations. You've got to talk about the vision for your family more than anyone. Because you've got to be on the same page about who God created them to be. Because the enemy's trying to destroy you again. Blended families, you've got to talk. I want you to think about, even in Proverbs, Solomon, with all of his wisdom, said, the shepherds have to know their flock, have to be diligent about their flock. What does it mean to be diligent? What does it mean to know your flock? It means who God's trusted you with. You understand. You study. If you're a diligent student, you study. If you're a diligent boss, you're aware. You're diligent. Your hands are... uh, You you mind other people's business. See, here's the problem with our kids. How many kids uh, uh, want their parents in their business? How many parents need to be in their kids' business? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Give them a hand clap. Those kids got to know you agree with me. Yeah. Don't look at your kids for permission. Can I do that? Is that okay? So let's talk about what it means to be in this fight. 1 Peter 5 8 tells us again be diligent. Why? Why are we told to be diligent? Because the, your adversary, say adversary, adversary, what does that mean? Your opponent. The enemy of your soul. The one who's out to get you. Be sober. Be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a what? Roaring lion. And what's he looking for? Suking whom he may devour. I don't want my kids to be the whom he finds. You know, there's an old saying goes when you're being chased by a lion or a bear. You don't have to be the fastest. You just got to be faster than the guy next to you. I'm going to train my kids to be fast, swift, diligent, evasive. Why? Because there's a roaring lion seeking whom. He doesn't care who it is. Oh, you know, we get so high and mighty religious sometimes. Oh, you must be going after God because the devil's giving you trouble. No, you're available. The enemy is lazy. He's looking for who's available. It's not because you're all that. Sometimes you're just there. So uh, what does a lion do? A lion, you know, not only do I watch the History Channel, I'm well cultured. I watch Discovery Channel too. And then you watch the animal planet. And I watch the lions. They crouch in the tall grass. And they pick out the old, the weak, and the dislodged. Uh Uh-oh. You get old, you get weak, you get dislodged. You hang out. They, They pick off the children, the little ones. Why? Because they're vulnerable. They're not looking at it going, look at that big meaty one right there. That one looks like it'd be a, that's a nice rump roast on that thing. No, they look for the little one, bones and all. Eat it. Why? Because he's looking at whom he may destroy. We've got to get this idea that the enemy, your adversary, the one who has rolled up his sleeves and is ready to punch you square in the nose. And you're going, can't we all be friends? Can't we just all get along? My teacher said in kindergarten, be nice. No, don't be nice. Be sober and be diligent. Be aware that there's someone trying to hurt your family and you need to be ready to fight for them. And it doesn't go away just because we ignore it. It doesn't go away. How many kids have been stolen from Orange County in the last five to ten years? Ask yourself that one. Go get on KOGT one more time. Go down to Brown Claybar and ask him to pull up a, a list of 18 and younger taken out by drinking and driving, by drugs, by suicide. 
Just ask and think, wait a minute. We lift in holy hands unto the Lord and our kids are dying. Somewhere the rubber's got to meet the road. And somewhere being diligent is not only in the worship center. It's got to get into the homes. See, Iva said earlier she saw the same walls. But you couldn't come to church to worship. You had to come prepared to worship. Listen, I believe in linking the anointing. Because when I was lost, I came to church and I used to love when y'all worshipped. You Christians would start worshipping and something would change. I could, y'all looked weird to me, honestly. But something was different and my heart kind of longed for it. But I didn't, it wasn't my worship. But it was something in the atmosphere. And there's some people that are lost that need to come in and they need to feel what they can't generate. That part of them's dead. But they, have you ever been around uh, static electricity? You ever scooted your feet across the floor and touch a doorknob? Or your wife? <laughs> hey, you may not see it, but it starts being generated. You can feel its effects. Hey, that's what the law started to come in. And they ought to be able to come in and go, that place is not normal. They've got something different. Why? Because we've came prepared. Our young people need to know that our homes are that place. So let's start talking about that. This fight that we're in, number one, we're in a fight. Number two, we better fight from the center. We better fight from the center. We're in a fight, one, we better fight from the center. We have an adversary. And you don't fight the adversary from the edges. You fight him from the center. What does that mean? We need to have a vision, a decision, and be diligent about what's the center of our home. We have had this all kind of, we have Dr. Spock giving us uh, information on how to parent. Oh, we should have child-centered parenting. How many of you know what child-centered parenting is? Anybody know what child-centered parenting? That's brat training 101. It's child-centered parenting. I believe in child-centered parenting. When they're hungry, I feed them. When they cry, I pick them up. When they want this, I do that. You're raising a brat is what you're doing. If you really like that stuff, okay, we'll send some others to you. You can, you can do child care for them. What happens we train them to be the center of their own world. That's not what we were called. Then others say, well, I don't want it to be him, so it must be me. And we choose me-centered parenting. Mom and dad, uh, we tell them they exist in our world and they're there for our joy. And my grandma was one of 14 children because they needed to cultivate the farm. That was not child-centered parenting. That was farm-centered parenting. They were workers. No, that's not what we're called to either. See, the center of the Christian home is Christ. When we set up Christ as the center of the home, that's where we begin to fight from. That is where our strength is. It's not in child-centered parenting. It's not in me-centered parenting. It's not in spouse-centered parenting. It is in Christ-centered parenting. Some of you are going, what in the world did I come to church today for? I'm, I'm just... It's killing me. Because today I want to talk to you about what might not be comfortable. Our families are being attacked. There's a generation being lost. There are grandparents raising their grandkids because their kids haven't learned to take responsibility yet. And if we can help bridge that gap, We'll change this culture. But if we don't talk about it, we'll never do it. And guess what? Grandmas and grandpas, those of you who have sweat and labored to put this church together and to have it, your kids aren't here. Look around. We go from gray to real young and there's no one in between. Why? We've got to ask those questions, don't we? Because it's not just our church. It's the church in America. There's a generation who's forgotten what it means to have Christ centered in their homes. I'm not trying to talk about how to grow community church. I'm trying to talk about how to save a generation for the kingdom of God. And that generation desperately needs it. And they know they need something. They just don't know what that something is yet. Because they haven't seen it quite yet. So we're going to start asking ourselves some very hard questions at community church. You are going to start asking yourself some hard questions at home. And we're going to help you come up with the questions. And you're going to help us come up with the questions. 
we're going to ask ourselves, are we strategic about reaching your missing loved ones? How many of you would love to see your kids in church again? I'm talking somewhere between 25 and 40 years old. How many of you love to see them in church again? Come on, like let's say it like you mean it. Yes, I want to see them in church again. How many of you know so far the church hasn't given them what it takes to get them here? I'm not talking about meeting their needs and scratching their ears. I'm talking about an encounter with the kingdom in a way they've never expected it. Because they've grown calloused to the way we've done church, right? Now, some of you are getting very, very nervous and going, Lord, he's changing something again. <laughs> no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about opening a dialogue and talking. Are we going to reach them? I believe we are. But we're going to surprise them. We're going to reach them the, the way they haven't anticipated. We're going to go around that callus. We're not going to rip it off. We're not going to file it down. We're going to go around it. We're going to go around those hard places and we're going to break through those broken walls. We're going to become the hands and feet of Christ. We're going to reach them in a way they don't expect it. Why? Because that's our mandate. We're going to do it. God's called us. God's called us from a Christ-centered place to begin to fight this adversary. Now, the Bible tells us that we need to uh, fight. Obviously, it talks about fight. Paul says he fought the good faith uh, fight. He's finished the race. He, we're, we're told uh, we're more than conquerors. We're told we're always triumphant in Christ. We're told with fight language quite a bit, right? And I want you to know that the, we need to understand this basic truth. You and I fight from victory, not for victory. When we have a Christ-centered home, we fight from victory, from Christ, not for it. You have a child-centered home, you're going to fight for victory. You have a selfish, me-centered home, you're going to fight for victory. But if you have a Christ-centered home, you're going to fight from a place of victory. And that's what God's called us to, to begin to fight for our families from this place of victory. Now let's talk about how to, how to fight. Uh, Dallas Willard is a, an author I really like, and he has something called VIM. He's passed away now, but vision, intention means V-I-M. Vision. It's the way things should be or ought to be or could be. You know, we, last week we talked about a vision for your home. If you haven't done that yet, grandma, grandpa, you don't like what you see in your kid's life. Good. Develop a vision for your grandkids and for your kids. Moms and dads of blended families, get together and write down a vision for your home and your kids. Single moms, for goodness sake, single moms, write down a vision for your kids, especially your sons little boys need daddies in their lives church men there are some single moms that need a dad not to come flirting with mama but to come put their arm around her son and be a mentor to him can I get an amen and then we have some moms that need that but there's some dads there's some dads who when their little girl starts getting up about 11, 12, 13 stuff starts happening and he's illiterate, doesn't know what to say. Guess what? There's a mama out there that doesn't need a date, but there's a little girl who needs some wisdom and understanding. So there needs to be someone who will speak into their lives. So we have to have a vision. Because if we don't have a vision, we let the world develop the vision for us. And some of our visions are being developed for our kids around us. And guess what happens? How many parents feel like they're driving a taxi cab? Your kid's schedule is running your life. You're running from here to there. Why? Because the world developed a vision for them in front of you. And you just went along going, okay, okay. Beware. When? Okay. See, when you have a vision, you learn this. A vision... Gives you the boundaries to know what to say yes to and what to say no to. So if I have a vision for my son. And my vision is to make him a ruler and reigner. Because he is a king and a priest in the kingdom of God. My daughter is a queen and a priestess. A priestess. Well, it works for Smurf ad. I don't know why it can't be Smurf. I don't know. And so now... When things come along, I get to ask, will this help? Will this elevate that? Because guess what? Otherwise, you know what my dad's vision was? My dad's vision was he was going to have athletes. 
So my mom ran around crazy to create athletes. And I was athletic in high school. But no one goes, tell me about your high school career. It's over. Get over it. Now go ahead. But what about a career in the kingdom of God? See, I believe if we could take young men that have a natural tendency that can throw a ball real fast or run real good and teach them, hey, excel in who God created you to be. Good good at that. But don't forget you're a king in baseball. You're a king in football. You're a king on the court. You're a priest in there. Don't forget who you are because it'll be defined by what you can do otherwise. Our kids shouldn't be defined by what they can do. It should be defined by who they are. Now, I won't take a ball out of anybody's hand. I like ball. But ball isn't my identity. The kingdom's my identity. Ball is the vehicle I use to reach a, to reach a world. There's some little girls that are good at sports too. There's some girls that are good at dance. There's some girls that are good at instruments. Are we raising them to be a, a queen and a priestess in the home? Or are we letting them just be what they're good at? I've watched some parents do it well, and I've watched some parents struggle with it. And the ones that do it well, those young men and young women are going to go, like the Bible says, they are our arrows. Remember when we had the baby blessing, I said that quiver full of arrows, and we're shooting our arrows into the future? Oh, we shoot them straight. We shoot them far. And their gifting and their talents take them far. But they, they, what carries them is their identity in Christ. Vision. Intention. We are intentional. We have a plan. We don't just go happy, go lucky. Guess what? We do not drift into transformation. You have to have a vision to change and an intent to change. When I became a Christian, there are some things that just fell off me. You know, bad language just left me. I didn't have a desire to curse anymore. I had bad language before, but it went away. But there are some other things that didn't go away. And I could just go, well, I, don't, I guess one day they'll go away too. Or I could become intentional about saying, I don't want that in my life anymore. There's a, there's a quote from an author who said, uh, Christians who curse are people that never intended not to. If you intend not to, you can stop. Why? Because intentional. A vision that says I can have a life free of this or a life full of this. And I have an intention to get there will begin to go there. And then the last part is means. A methodology. Vision. Who I could be, who I should be. Intention, I'm going to write out a plan. I'm going to, I'm going to write it down and make it sure. And then means. I think there's three parts to means that we need to talk about. Vision, intention, means. V-I-M. Means relational, habitual, relational, habitual. And I'm going to come up with a third one. I'm not repeating it on purpose. I'm, my brain just had a cramp. Experiential. Ha <laughs> ha. Relational. Why do we believe in small groups? Why do we want to have a Thursday night family discussion night? Why do we want to have dinner around a table and not at TV trays? Why do we want to do these things? Because relationship is the cultivating field of change in a family, in society, in in life. We do not change and avoid. If you want to transform, have a vision, be intentional, and get into the right relationships. How many of you know that relationships modify your behavior based on the relationships you're in? When I was in eighth grade, my dad, there was a kid I was hanging out with. And he wasn't very good news. He was a lot of fun to be around, honestly. His mom and dad were pretty lax. We could get away with a lot, which I like to do a lot, so it worked out well. And my dad was around him a little bit. And he, my dad wasn't a Christian. He wasn't saved. He just looked at him and he said, you can't be around that kid anymore. That was my eighth grade year. I was mad at my dad, but I was scared of my dad. So he said, no. I said, no. Uh, under my breath, didn't like it. In two years, that kid ended up in all kinds of trouble by the time we were sophomores. I don't even know if he graduated high school. I'm telling you, my life would have been different if my dad wouldn't have stepped into my life and said, I've seen into his behavior, I've seen into his heart, and I see things I don't want in your life, and you will not be around him. My dad saved me from a path of destruction because he set the boundaries. And if my dad could do that with his problems, without the kingdom of God, why can't we? The habits in our lives. 
Let's talk about vision one more time. This idea that kids deserve privacy. I know I'm not going to win any friends with the teenagers right now, but that's a lie. Ain't no teenager has privacy. Privacy gets you beat up and hurt. Privacy is what causes kids to start cutting themselves and feel like they're not... Your mom and dad need to be aware of what's going on in your life. They are your best backstop. They are the best support you will ever have. They don't need to be shut out, but they need to come in the right way. They don't come in because they need to fix you. They come in because God called them to help mold you. There's a partnership between them and the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who knows who you were created to be, and their job is to help get you there. Invite them in. There's no phone with a password. There's no separate email accounts. Somewhere, get involved. Know what's going on in the hearts of your kids. Wednesday night, Dan can deal with that. (laughs) And then lastly, we talk about intention, means, relational. What are the habits in your family? Does your family have a habit of eating dinner together and talking? Does your family have a habit of prayer? Before work, do you have a habit of getting together and talking and sharing? There's just some basic habits that you can develop in a family. What are the habits? And then what are the experiences? See, we're building on that known for our youth. We're building a gymnasium and we're doing all that. And a lot of questions are, why are we doing all this? Why? There's some grandparents wondering, why? I helped build the church. Why are we going to now build a gym? Why do we need a cafe? Why? Because relationships why because we want to we want listen parents grandparents there's one more part remember experiential what changes your life transform you is whether you have a vision whether you have a plan and do your experiences match that we do everything we do We send our kids to camp his way. We go on mission trips. We put gyms up. We have a school. We put in a coffee shop because we want to be the ones that give them the experiences. That's the reason we do what we do. That's the reason. We say we are going to be the ones who give the experiences. I'm not going to count on the world. I'm not going to count on the Disney cruise. I'm surely not going to count on Carnival. I'm I'm going to give the experiences. We, together, give the experiences. That's why moms and dads, we want, uh, people ask why we started doing family mission trips. Because sending our kids to do mission work without us going with them is not giving them an experience with the family. Why do we send them to Camp His Way? Because we want them to have an experience with an encounter with God. Why do we send them uh, to any other place we're going to go? Because that's what God's called us to do. Yes, I want you to go on vacation with your kids. Why? Because there's an experience. You know what? When we go on vacation, I get in the driver's seat. I put the cruise control on somewhere between 75 and 78. Don't test me on this. And what do the kids do? They flip down that thing that has a DVD player, put a DVD in or put their headphones in and we can go on a trip without talking. (laughs) But you know what takes intention? You know what takes intention? It's somewhere on that 10-hour trip to Atlanta is to shut the DVD player and take out the headphones and begin to talk. And here's the thing, parents. The best conversations are never at the right time. They say that uh, a a person is at their peak between 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. And some reason my children want to talk between 11 p.m. and 12 p.m. I'm going, don't you know nothing? It's never convenient. But it's always right. Guys, our heart is to be a church where the power and the presence of God is so real. But if we have that, and we do not have the nucleus of the family, we will be a place for people to go and encounter God, but not a place for people to go and carry God with them. I want to be a place that helps people carry His presence. Yes, they need an encounter. 
but it's time for us to carry it. Let's not worry about carrying it to Kroger for today. Today, let's not worry about carrying it to Walmart. Today, let's just carry it home. Why don't today we carry it to the dinner table? Why don't this week we carry it to Thanksgiving? And this week around our family and our friends, when we gather hands and we begin to be thankful, why don't someone in this room begin to get a download from heaven and instead of just saying what I'm thankful for, begin to speak a vision of heaven into lives and begin to declare the goodness of God over them and begin to unlock what God has been screaming at them And begin to say things like, I see in you this. And I see in you that. And I see God forming this in you. And you begin to fill in the blanks, not with wishful thinking, but because you've prayed and sought heaven about it. And you have a word. A word of wisdom. And a word of knowledge. Birthed from the Spirit of God and delivered into the lives of your kids. Our kids deserve it. Heaven is calling for it. And this world is crying out. Church, will you stand to your feet? This hasn't been a big, uh, passionate message. It hasn't involved a bunch of jumping up and down, which apparently I'm known for. But it is real. Moms, dads, stepmoms, stepdads, grandparents. Will we decide, will we decide today to reach into a generation and walk them into a kingdom? That's the power you've been given. Vision, intention, and means. Because you're in a fight. Are you fighting from the center or are you fighting from the edges? The center is the only safe place to be. It doesn't mean there's not a fight there. It just means you're stuck right inside the great big protective heart of God. And the enemy may may fire his darts at you, but they don't touch you. Because they can't penetrate the presence of God. The safest place to be. the the, The power, the presence, the heart of God. Father, we come to you today in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I know that we need to fight for our families and we need to press in like never before. And Lord, I pray that our church will develop a a vision for who our kids were called to be, that that we're, we're trusting them and we're training them and we're building them up for that moms and dads and grandparents will begin to stand in the gap once again and to begin to declare your heart over our kids. That we will not see what's wrong with them. That we will see what you're doing in them, Father. And Father, we will begin to speak with life like never before. Father, that we will have a shepherd's heart once again. And that we will fight off the adversary again. That we will fight from victory. That we will fight from your heart. Father, as we go from this place today, I pray that your richest blessings will be upon our people. And then our people that are hungry for you will, will taste and see that you're good like never before. And Lord, there are those here this morning that, that do not know you, that, that have heard a message and some of it made sense and some of it didn't. Father God, that today you will speak to them where they are. And that, Father, you will begin to put hope into them again. That their life is not hopeless It's just incomplete without you. And that today they will begin to find that completion in you. So Christ, I ask that you will open the hearts of those who need to know you. With every head bowed and all the eyes closed, I'm going to ask. If you're here this morning and you want to give your life to Christ, if you want to rededicate your life, if you're just saying, I've been on the outside and I'm ready to be inside again. Will you raise your hand so I can pray for you? Yes, sir. Yes. See it up. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Any others? Well, Father, those that lifted their hands, I pray that today they're able to move into the inside, into into that secret place to where you are. Father, that you will cover them with the blood of Christ, that today as we pray together, as they pray with the prayer partners, as they rededicate themselves to you, as they give themselves to you, 
that they will know what it means to be home, that their heart and their soul will find home. As your heads are still bowed, if we have some people here that would say, I've been in a fight in my family. We, not with each other, but you have just felt a fight going on for your kids or for your family as a whole. You just feel something the enemy's been attacking in some way. And you're not wanting to condemn anybody. You're just wanting to say, hey, pray for me that we, that we fight from a good place. That we do not let ourselves become enemies of one another, but we fight for each other. Will you raise your hand? Amen. You're fighting for your kids right now. You're fighting for your destiny right now. Yes. How many grandparents are fighting for their kids and their grandkids right now? Just raise your hand. Let me pray for you. Amen. Well, Father, we declare that they're fighting from a place of victory, that they're fighting from the center, that their hearts are for you. And Father, I pray for a vision over their family and their kids and their grandkids. Father, I pray that your still small voice will reach beyond the noise of their lives, that you'll reach beyond the, 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 the distractions and reach into their hearts and begin to form them and make them tender toward you. Father, I ask that as we gather around Thanksgiving this week, that you'll give us opportunities to connect like never before and that we will come back Sunday with testimony after testimony of your goodness, of how you've declared good things into our lives and how people broke hearing it. Father, may we speak life into our families again. Prayer partners, will you make your way to the front church? We're going to worship some more. If you need to be dismissed, well, well, Jerry will dismiss you in just a second. But we want to give time for some response. If you raised your hand for some reason, and maybe you haven't raised your hand yet, but you just need to pray with somebody. These prayer partners are here for you. If you raised your hand, though, for committing your life to Christ or recommitting, you need to run down to these altars and say, here I am. The Bible says, if you'll confess me before men, I'll confess you before the Father. Today, you get to confess him. Let's, let's reclaim our families. How many of you want to reclaim our families for Christ? Can you give Him glory this morning? Give Him glory this morning. Well, let's sing together. And your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. And your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. We know your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. Come on, let's declare that this morning. We know, Lord, and your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Lord, your love never fails. It never runs out on me, Lord. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love, your love, it never fails. Your love, your love, your love. We declare that this morning, Lord God. Thank you for your love that you're ever pursuing us, Lord God. Thank you for your word this morning, Lord God. It brings life. So, Father, right now, I just speak over this group of people, Lord God, this group of believers, this group of Christ followers, Lord God, that we will be blessed beyond measure. Father God, that your face would shine down upon us. Lord God, that you would be gracious, Father, as, as your presence surrounds us this week, Lord. God, and I speak uh, just favor in our words, favor in our heart, Lord God, uh, as, we, as we begin to speak life into those family members, Lord God, as we begin to speak life, Lord God, in, into, uh, in, into places that may have been uh, estranged before. Father God, I just, I just speak reconciliation uh, this week, Lord God, in Jesus' name, that you would begin to draw families together, that you would begin to draw sons together, uh, uh, to their fathers and that you would begin to draw daughters to their mothers this week Lord God that you would draw families close close together God in the name of Jesus 
that, Father God, that this week we would be able to celebrate, Father God, just the goodness that is you, Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, I speak favor over this congregation. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You guys be dismissed. Uh, have a great week. Happy Thanksgiving. Uh, let's be a blessing. Amen. Amen. Higher than and higher than the mountains that I face. Love is stronger than the power of the grave. We believe it, Lord. Yeah. Oh, you're constant in the trial and the change. This one. Oh, it never